Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back to Voice of Islam TV. Um, my name is Amanda. I'm joining you this morning from Cardiff in the United Kingdom. I'd like to say welcome to all of our viewers in New Zealand, in the UK and around the world, mashallah. Today I am delighted to welcome to our channel Sister Fatima Barakatullah who is a, uh, a, a local, very active Muslim sister here in the UK, and who is author of this book, which we're going to be talking about today, Khadija, Mother of History's Greatest Nation. Um, sister Fatima, welcome to the program. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Um, just for the audience, I know, mashallah, here in the UK, you're quite well known within the Muslim community, tabarakallah, but for our international audience, could you just introduce yourself a little bit, um, you know, a uh, little bit about where you're from, what you do, your background and so on? Okay, um, alhamdulillah, I'm a, I was born in London, I'm a Londoner, uh, my parents are originally from India. Uh, and <clears throat> I <clears throat> was educated in the UK. I traveled to Egypt and studied uh, Arabic and Islamic studies uh, at a college of Al-Azhar University. And then I completed my Islamic studies, Sharia studies here in the UK at two Islamic seminaries, uh, the Ibrahim College Seminary and the As-Salam Institute Seminary. So Alhamdulillah, I completed my Alamiya studies um, I'm cur currently doing my master's at, uh, in Islamic law at uh, SOAS, the School of Oriental and African Studies in the University of London. Um, and alhamdulillah, you know, over the years I've had the opportunity to speak on various uh, media outlets, on all kinds of topics related to Islam uh, on the BBC, Channel 4, and various channels here in the UK. Um, and... Um, Alhamdulillah, you know, I teach and uh, I'm a student as well. So, mashallah, tabarakallah. Yes, I think learning never ends, does it, mashallah, especially with the Islamic sciences. So, so you sure. are you a full time student then at SOAS? No, I'm a part time student. Okay, mashallah. May Allah make you successful in that. I went to SOAS as well, so I'm thinking, yeah, you know, the ah, SOAS student. Alhamdulillah. 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 alhamdulillah, that's amazing. Um, okay, so could I just ask you, now you've written this book about our mother Khadija, mm -hmm. anha, and could you tell us a little bit about that? Um, you know, what inspired you to write this book? Yeah, so alhamdulillah, like ever since I was a little girl, my dad would buy me books, whatever books he could. So my dad is a scholar from uh, India, from Deoband. Okay. And um, he, <clears throat> so we were a religious family growing up in the 80s in the UK when there were hardly any books in English. Well, there were, but they were yeah. of varying qualities, you could say, right? Yeah. And my dad would, <laughs> yeah, and my dad would um, do his best to find books in English for us. And I remember once he bought me a book about the life of Fatima, radila anha, and because my name was Fatima, so, you know, he thought it would resonate with me. And <clears throat> the way that this book was written, it was written for children. But, you know, in those days, books were usually translations or they were yeah. written in a very kind of factual, dry kind of way, you know. Mm. Um, <clears throat> and so I remember reading the book and, of course, there were inspiring things in the book, but overall i remember leaving the book feeling quite a little bit depressed actually because because, because the way in which uh, fatima radila anha's life was presented was not in a particularly inspiring way or it hadn't been framed in such a way that a child with which i was at the time could mm -hmm. really draw lessons from it or could feel kind of like this was a role model for a child growing up in the West, you know? It was very hard to find any kind of connection. Um, so when, as an adult, when the opportunity came along, the publisher actually approached me um, because they were looking for somebody who could research in Arabic 
as well as right. Um, so when they approached me, I thought, hmm, this is a real, I kind of relished the opportunity, you know? And mm -hmm. I would say through the process of writing the book, I actually became a better writer and learnt how to write a book for children, which is a different art to writing other types of books. Um, and one of the key things I would say I tried to do because of my experience as a child was to emotionally take care of the child throughout the journey of Khadija's life, you see? Um, okay. So that especially children growing up in the West could understand the significance of various things and perhaps be able to kind of see how it would apply to their life. Mm, I see what you're saying. Okay, that's very interesting. So when you say the book that your father gave you, the one about Fatima, would you say that it was quite when when you say it left you feeling depressed is was that because it it was just dry facts or was it because of you know the actual events of her life and so on so for example at the end of a story you know somebody the 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 protagonist usually part, dies right <laughs> like in yes. in a in a biographical right in a biographical yes. story but for a child like that death needs to be framed in a certain way, you know, so that they can mm. understand. Like, so, for example, with Khadija, anha, although she passed away at the end uh, at quite a difficult point in the history of Muslims, you know, before mm. the Prophet وسلم, even traveled to Medina, right? Um, yeah. What the child needs to know is that ultimately Khadija was successful, you know, that mm. ultimately her impact was felt throughout the world. Um, and so wh what I'm trying to say is that uh, until very recently, Muslim authors have not really been very careful about the emotional journey of the reader, you know, uh, mm -hmm. what the reader is feeling as they're reading. So it's, it's very easy to absorb facts, but, you know, we as human beings are emotional beings and we need... Yeah. Uh, to be able to understand how something fits in to our our world emotionally, right? And the 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 reader's feelings need to be taken care of as as they're going through the journey. So, you know, typically, if somebody just dies at the end and you know they become ill and then they die, it's like yeah. And and unless you kind of show people how that sits in the kind of bigger picture of history, right? And how the rest of their life has affected other things. Um, mm -hmm. For a child, it's very hard to kind of uh, be able to kind of see that as inspiring, you know? Certain things need to be spelt out, yeah. that's what I mean. Mm -hmm. I see what you're saying, subhanAllah, yeah. yeah. Okay, Jazakallah khair for explaining that. I mean, I've read the book, mashallah, and oh, alhamdulillah. It is, it is written for quite a young target demographic, I will say. Um, mm. And yet, even at my, mashallah, advanced age, I found it very enjoyable. You know, it was oh, obviously yeah. a simple read, a quick read for an adult, but there were still things in there that I benefited from, such as, you know, um, the discussion of the life of Khadija, radiallahu anha, before she even married the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Right. You know how she how she she knew that there was you know a, a prophet foretold coming that she knew and she knew that this man had good character she was she was on the lookout essentially and I think that this is something that is often sort of glossed over when you read a lot of books about Sira, which are focusing obviously on the life of the prophet وسلم, and not necessarily on the lives of the people around him. Mm -hmm. um, this this you know it really helped to flesh it out and to you know give her a very a much more three-dimensional character um you know this i feel that this book even though it's aimed at quite a young audience mashallah it really brought the character of khadija to life sort of in into three dimensions four dimensions i felt like i knew her a little bit better right that's exactly what i wanted to do so 
Alhamdulillah, excellent. So no, I, I think you have succeeded in that. So I would really recommend this book, not just for children, for for older, you know, for older teenagers as well. I think they would find it enjoyable, mm. or you know, anybody. Mashallah, I think it is really a good read for people to to get into. And because it's written for a younger audience, it's not something that's going to take ages for an adult to read either, which is, you know, makes it makes it a, an easy thing to pick up and to share with your friends and family. Um, where can people buy the book from? Um, so I think there are a number of ways they could try to buy the book because I, 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 um, I appreciate that we have an international audience. So I oh, yeah. wouldn't be able to be specific, but uh, in some countries it will be on Amazon, um, through sellers, you know, um, otherwise it's uh, available as a Kindle book. And also um, you can always contact the uh, publisher themselves. So they have their own website, Learning Roots. Uh, if you look up Learning Roots, Khadija, anha, it will come up. And um, yeah, you can contact the, the uh, publisher directly because they sometimes have branches in various countries. So okay, so the, the publisher, just for everybody listening, it's learningroots.com. Mm -hmm. So that would be the main website. Um, and obviously the Kindle edition, you can download it freely. But for the viewers, there's also a link in the description where you can download a chapter of the book for free to sample it. So you can see what it is that we're talking about. Masha'Allah. Yeah. So if you go to that link, you can download that too, which um Ustada Fatima has generously supplied us with, mashallah. So, sister, you have a topic to discuss with us today, which is five great lessons from the life of Khadija. Hmm. Um, what would be the first lesson that you want to impart on us? Yeah, so as I was um, working on this book, um, you know, I, I think anytime you're working on and you're researching the life of a person, you really start noticing things that maybe are not in the public conscience so much um and especially with the female companions you know um it's very easy to find online for example lectures about various uh, especially the male companions you know in detail and their lives etc um but often especially if, even in islamic book bookshops uh the lives of the female companions have been kind of secondary or they haven't really been written about in as much detail, especially in English. So when I was in the process of doing this, I found, you know, <clears throat> that there were these big, powerful lessons from her life for us as Muslims that were just staring at me. And I just really decided one day to articulate them. And, um, you know, I, I feel like they are lessons for all of our lives. So the first lesson, the first powerful lesson from the life of Khadija anha is to live for a vision beyond your own life. And the reason why I say that is because, you know, Khadija radila anha, she, if you think about the trajectory of her life, she uh, got married to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam after being widowed. And she, uh, and then he became uh, the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And then their lives completely changed, right? And they went through this period of, uh, persecution, right, in 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 Mecca, to the point that they were actually even uh, expelled from their homes. And mm. and remember, Khadija was a noble woman. She was like an upper class woman um, who had lived a very comfortable life. You know, in the sense that she was from a wealthy family. She had servants. She had uh, she had her own business. Uh, that she had in inherited, I believe, from one of her uh, husbands. Mm -hmm. And she was managing all of that. Um, and then suddenly she became like this persona non grata in, you know, in Mecca, uh, being treated like the enemy, right? Her whole her family was being treated like the enemy and being persecuted. And for a time, there was a boycott where the Prophet وسلم, and his family, including Khadija, were expelled. They lived in a very narrow valley in tents. And, you know, nobody was allowed to buy from them or sell to them or provide them with food or anything. Uh, one of her nephews used to break the boycott and 
occasionally uh, send some supplies, you know, to to her and her family. But all of that kind of difficulty and persecution that they went through, and then she passed away, right? Just before they, um, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, found uh, refuge in Medina, right? So in a way, Khadija died before she could see the fruit of her work, you know, in this life. So all that effort, all that, you know, she never saw Islam flourishing uh, throughout Medina, throughout Arabia, and then obviously throughout the world. She never got to experience that. And yet she was living for a vision for something that would actually uh, actualize itself after her life or beyond her life. And so in that, I think, is a lesson for all of us that the fruit we may not see the fruit of our work in this life, you know, but we've got to do it anyway. We've got to do the work anyway. So that's the first kind of big that is, lesson from the life of Khadija, I think. Inshallah. And that is such an important lesson. Um mm-hmm. You know, subhanAllah, one thing that I've noticed working with Muslim communities is a lack of long-term strategic planning, a lack of long-term vision, uh, an impatience to, to to try to get results now, now. you know, within, mm. within the next, you know, uh, and, and when things don't work out, projects are abandoned so quickly. And I, mm. I always think to myself, you know, subhanAllah, I, we have to work and we may never see the results of it. Maybe our children, our grandchildren even won't right. see the results of it, you know, subhanAllah. And so this is exactly what our mother Khadija radiallahu anha was, was experiencing, this, this incredible yeah. hardship, the likes of which we have never experienced. If you think about it, um, Sister Amanda, that we sitting here in, in London, in Cardiff, in New Zealand, wherever we are in the world today, we are all part of Khadija's legacy, right? Yeah. Because she literally funded the Islamic cause. She she funded the da'wah of uh, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, right? Yeah. Um, and so we are part of her legacy, and that's an amazing thing, right? Like if it wasn't for the effort of people like Khadija, uh, the message of Islam would not have flourished in the way that it did, right? Allah chose her to be that. Uh, facilitator in a way subhanallah and i think uh, you know i'd like to just sort of interject here although both of us mm. are sisters and we are speaking about our mother but these are lessons mm-hmm. for everybody not just for women of course mm-hmm. absolutely of course. but i think sometimes yeah. we need to state that a little bit obviously even though it may be obvious <laughs> okay, just yeah. to, you know, to remind everybody that these are lessons for everybody and that when we talk about the female companions and the wives of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the lessons from their lives are for everybody to learn. We shouldn't just restrict it to, you know, women's issues, quote unquote. So mm. I think that that's, that's an incredible lesson from her yeah. life, mashallah. What is the second lesson? That you have? So the second powerful lesson from the life of Khadija is uh, to seek our status with Allah. Now, the reason why I worded it like that is that Khadija anha had a status, you see, before the message of Islam came. Uh, she was a noble woman. She was like a celebrity. Even the Prophet sallallahu as a couple, they were like a power couple, you know, in in Mecca. Um, and I think what we don't realize is that when on that day, that fateful day, when uh, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam came down from the mountain and he came home and he told Khadija what happened to him, told her to cover him up and wrap him up. And then she took him to Waraka, her cousin. And he said to the Prophet ﷺ, I wish that I was a young man. He said, I wish I was a young man so that I could help you when your people turn you out. (laughs) At that moment, Khadija and the Prophet ﷺ would have realized that their status in this society was about to change completely, you know. Mm. And this is why the Prophet ﷺ was so shocked. And he said to Waraka, are they really going to throw me out? Are they really going to turn me out of my town? You know, because he 
him and Khadija, they were like the beloved people of that town. Mm. Um, and he said, and you know, Waraka said those words, he said, you know, that anyone who's come with a message such as yours has always been persecuted, you know. Mm -hmm. So I think what we have to realize is that Khadija radiallahu anha, she chose to stand by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and it wasn't a given that every prophet's wife or family stood by them, right? We know that the uh, prophet Noah, alayhi salam, the prophet Lut, alayhi, mm -hmm. alayhi salam, their spouses did not stand by them, right? Um, they yeah. abandoned them. And what that goes to show is that, you know, when, when a messenger of Allah comes, and especially in the early part of their message, they're not popular. It's not easy. Uh, they're seen as strange. Their message is seen as freakish. And at that point, the people who can stand by the messenger are of a completely different status to the people who come later when the religion becomes popular, when the message is accepted, and when you know it's in a state of strength and power, right? So Khadija radiallahu anha, she chose gaining her status with Allah above her status in this life. Um, and I think uh, there's a beautiful hadith in which, you know, uh, let me just find it. The Prophet وسلم, told Khadija that the angel Jibreel had come to say salam to Khadija, you know, and said salam to her and uh, conveyed salams from uh from even the from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and one moment he said about her that you know he said oh messenger of Allah Khadija is coming with a bowl of soup for you when she comes to you give her greetings of peace from her Lord from Allah and from me and give her the good news of a palace of jewels in Jannah where there will be neither any noise nor any tiredness. So although she lost her worldly status in this life, uh, in that society anyway, mm. um, she gained her status with Allah. And so the lesson for us is that, you know, in standing for the truth, in obeying Allah, we might not win popularity contests, right? We might lose our worldly status and and you know how many people sometimes compromise don't they on on their deen on their on their beliefs in order to fit in in order to be accepted in order to keep their job which is basically keeping your status right etc yes, yeah. etc so so the the lesson there is that if you make Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala your number one concern and your status with him what Allah thinks mm -hmm. of you then not only will you gain status with Allah and in the hereafter, but Allah will establish love for you in the hearts of people on this earth. Because ultimately Khadija, you know, where are the people who persecuted Khadija? Nobody knows about them, right? Yeah. Then they're nobodies. <laughs> but Khadija radiallahu anha, her name lives on, right? SubhanAllah. SubhanAllah. Yes. I mean, 1500 years later, here we are discussing her life. Exactly. SubhanAllah. SubhanAllah. Yes. SubhanAllah. So we've had, so the first lesson, just to reiterate for those who are joining us, um, sort of midway through the program, we've, we're talking about Sister Fatima Barkatullah's book, Khadija, Mother of History's Greatest Nation, and five great lessons from her life. Um, mm -hmm. What would you say is the third lesson then? So the third, the third powerful lesson from the life of Khadija is to patiently persevere in the face of ignorance. Um, or another way of saying it is even the most beloved people faced Islamophobia, right? So mm. subhanAllah, like when we think of those people, people like Khadija and the Prophet وسلم, and sometimes, you know, living in our times, we act as though it's never been worse, you know, <laughs> like the way mm. that Muslims have been feeling and experiencing things, you know, is something modern. 
But actually, if you look at the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the way Khadija Radhiya Anha and her family were treated, you know, the best of people experienced Islamophobia. The best of people experienced that persecution. And so <clears throat> what we learn from them is that it's to be expected. A, a level of resistance to the message of Islam is to be expected. And not that we accept persecution, but that we persevere and we don't give up and we continue to obey Allah and we continue to stay away from the things that Allah has forbidden in the face of that ignorance and that persecution, right? Uh, and I think, you know, our brothers and sisters in New Zealand are a wonderful example of that because, you know, so, what they experienced, um, I don't even remember how long ago it was. Um, has it been a year and a half ago? Not, not two years. Yeah, I don't know. Subhanallah. It feels, it feels so recent. But it feels like two days, subhanAllah. Yeah, so what our brothers and sisters experienced, the rest of us around the world witnessed, you know, and they touched they, the way they responded and their courage and their refusal to become bitter, you know. SubhanAllah, mm. some of the amazing individuals that were being interviewed um, and how they were responding and saying that, you know, they had peace in their hearts and they, SubhanAllah, it was like, it was from another world, right? So mm. by being role models, by being role models, even when uh, they they faced the worst types of Islamophobia, um, they, they moved the world. You know, they moved mm. politicians, they moved lawmakers, they, they moved the entire nation, I think, of New Zealand and beyond. So... You can see, I, I think our brothers and sisters in New Zealand, you know, they don't need any lessons from me in that regard. Um, you know, they have been amazing role models. Uh, but what Khadija's life reminds us of is that we're not the first, you know. Our generation is not the first to experience Islamophobia. It's happened before. I'll give you some examples from Khadija's life. So at one point, you know, the wife of Abu Lahab, who was the uncle of the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, she would hire slaves from the from the town to go and throw the garbage and rubbish from the town over the walls of the house of Khadija so that they would enter into her courtyard. So you can just imagine she would she would be sitting maybe with her children, she might be doing something, and suddenly all this filth and you know rubbish would just come crashing over the walls right into her, her courtyard um, and this was like a regular campaign of hate that the wife of Abu Lahab conducted against Khadija's family also when Khadija radiallahu and her son passed away so one of her sons passed away in infancy the mushrikun the uh, polytheists in Medina in, in Mecca sorry they began to mock her family and mock the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and you know labeled him as Abtar, which means like you know you won't you are cut off, you don't have any yeah. lineage, you don't have any uh, progeny, right? And I, I just want us to think about like how would that have felt? Imagine you've just gone through a personal, a massive personal tragedy, and the society around you is mocking you and laughing at you, right? I mean, it, it, it was terrible. And then of course, we, we already mentioned the the actual physical persecution of you know them being expelled from their homes. So I think the the lesson for us is that there may be tough times ahead, but that with commitment and continuing to do our work, obeying Allah, uh, and asking ourselves, what is Allah asking of me in this situation? You know, um, that ultimately the believers will be successful because Allah says in the Quran. That the end success is for the believers. Mm. When you say the end success, though, yeah, again, this ties into the first lesson of, you know, having a vision beyond your own life. That mm. success may not be 
our individual personal success. You know, where yeah. we need to think of the believers as being, as that he says, one body. Yeah. But we all have a role to play. But it might be long term. It might be, you know, in in five years, twenty years, a hundred years, three hundred years. Allahu alam. It's it. You know, it may not be our personal success, but as long as we strive, we also have our personal success. But perhaps not in dunya. Mm. I think in the way to, I think the way to look at it is: look, Allah does promise that those who believe in Him and and uh, do work righteous deeds and live a good life. Allah will give them joy in this life as well. You know, the, the sweetness of Iman, the sweetness of faith, which mm -hmm. is not something that you can really tangibly quantify or, you know, explain to somebody who doesn't, who hasn't experienced that, right? Yeah. So, yeah. so there isn't, I don't want it to sound as though, you know, we're saying that the believer is definitely going to have a life that is miserable or something like that. You know, I don't want that to come across you know um no. it, that, that's not what it is what i mean is that this life will be full of tests and yeah. allah has given us guidance as to how to overcome those tests and in doing that we will experience a, a sweetness of course you know or, and a happiness a joy that is very hard to explain to those who don't experience it the sweetness of faith um but in terms of what the world values, what the world thinks is success, you know, money, fame, uh, freedom, whatever all those things are, you know, that the world labels as success, um, mm -hmm. we may, we we were not created for those things, right? So mm -hmm. we're not going to indulge in those things. We're not going to be seen as successful, you know, by most people. Our focus has to be on what success is as defined by Allah, right? Absolutely, yes. Jazakallah Um So what is the fourth lesson then? So the fourth lesson is be a tool for Allah's cause. Um, one of the blessings of Khadija anha was that she was a wealthy woman. Um, but you see, sometimes we highlight the fact that she was a businesswoman or that she was a wealthy woman and we leave it at that as if being wealthy in it in and of itself is a virtue mm. but rather it's not the fact that she was wealthy that was an amazing thing it's what she did with her wealth right it's what she mm. did with her wealth and her willingness to use her wealth and resources in the way of allah was her one of her greatest traits in fact, uh, the Prophet وسلم, would get very emotional after the death of Khadija, anha, even you know, into his time in Medina. And he could never forget how readily she had believed in him and how selflessly she had put her resources at his disposal. Right? So every time you think about, you know, the Prophet وسلم, organizing a uh, big dinner for his relatives when he's inviting them to Islam or, you know, all of these kinds of things. Mm. You have to remember that it was Khadija's wealth that was funding that, right? Mm. It was Khadija behind that. So the Prophet wasallam said about her um, after her death, he said, she had faith in me when people rejected me. She believed in me when people disbelieved me. She supported me with her wealth when people prevented me. And Allah blessed me with children through her and not through any other wife. So she was a tool and she made herself a tool using whatever resources she had for the sake of Allah. And in that is a lesson for us that we all have resources. We all have talents. We all have things that we could utilize to become tools for Allah's cause, for spreading the message of Islam, for uh, changing the way people see Muslims, by for actually changing society and doing good in society, right? Mm -hmm. So if we put <clears throat> our resources, whether they're material or otherwise, you know, it could be your time, it could be your wealth, it could be opening up your home, 
It could be our children as well, right? Because human beings do treat their children, even though people act as though they don't. We treat children as resources. You know, it's countries, mm -hmm. whole countries treat children as resources, wanting them to be educated in particular areas, wanting them to, you know, uh, go into certain jobs, etc. You know, if you do it for the sake of Allah, you point your children in the direction such and you bring them up such that they have a higher consciousness not just to make money but you know to serve mm -hmm. allah then then we would have been successful in um, teaching them to be tools for allah so that's the fourth lesson okay i think somebody has put into the comments and actually i did want to interject at this point that mm. if of our viewers have questions for Sister Fatima, please do put them into the chat and we will try to ask them at the end. Um, but somebody's, somebody's rightly noted in the comments that wealth can also be a trial. It's not always a blessing. And mm -hmm. I think this is an important reminder for us that, you know, when we're looking at the life of Khadija, radiallahu anha, yes, she was wealthy, mashallah. And how, as you said, is that how she used that wealth was in Allah's cause once the call came. You know, yeah, she didn't, because, didn't think, you know, oh, I'll, I'll give, you know, 20% of my wealth for this cause, but I'm going to keep the rest for myself or anything like that. Literally everything she had, she gave. Or even, you know, how many spouses would actually stand by their spouse, you know, if they were being treated in the way the Prophet ﷺ was being treated. If they had come with a message that, you know, most of society was rejecting and yeah. you know vilifying so even just her willingness to stay with him and stand by him and then support him financially in every way um was amazing and yes of course wealth can be a test and the test is that the resources you've been given how will you use them right exactly yeah will you use them for good or will you use them for selfish reasons right so exactly. Jazakallah khair for that. Which brings us to the fifth lesson. So the fifth lesson is uh, more of a, I would say, down to earth lesson, which um, I feel that is often overlooked, and that is that to be the backbone of your family, to be the backbone of your family, because that's what Khadija was, you know. Um, although people sometimes try to cast her as uh, some kind of um, uh, kind of symbol of female empowerment or something, right? Um, Khadija was a wife, and she was a very devoted wife, mm. and that's one of the things that made her, or well, that's the key thing that made her have the status that she she had. She was a source of comfort for the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, a sanctu a sanctuary that he could retreat to. Right? Where, where did he want to go when he was, uh, when he wanted to find strength? Uh, where did he uh, go when he was first given that monumental message? Right? Um, he needed Khadija, and he wanted Khadija by his side, and she strengthened him. She reassured him. She supported him. She listened. She was present to his needs. Mm. And, you know, even, even before his message, that just the fact that she would, she understood his need to go up on the mountain, you know, for days. <laughs> you know, how many spouses would be okay with that, right? Not many. <laughs> <laughs> and deliver food to him. She, she would deliver food to him. And like anyone who's been up on that mountain, which I have, you know, as a child, I, I climbed all the way to the top. Uh, it's not. It's not easy. It's not. It's not like a. It's, it's, you know, a it's not like a little hill. Sorry. It, it is a climb. I think yeah. that when I, when I went on Umrah and I saw it, I thought that's what she climbed up. Mm. I didn't climb it. I saw it from the comfort of the bus. <laughs> but I could think, you know, uh, yeah. that that is devotion. Yes. Yes, and so I think. Look, you know. Every home needs a pillar of strength to steady it. And in our times, that's not a fashionable message, you know, to give mm. to women uh, and, and to even to men, right? 
uh, that actually the home needs to be prioritized. The family needs to be prioritized. But, you know, each of us, husbands and wives, have our part to play in, in showing support and love to one another. But the particular type of security that Khadija Radilana provided, I think, was one that us as women can provide, you know. Um, and, and that's something we should be proud of, not something that, you know, society's kind of devalued that now, you know. And yet, by, by the home environment being stable, right, with the home environment having somebody who's focused on it, um, by treating your family as a project, you know, like your finest project, uh, what we do is we, we create the healthy environment from which excellence will flourish in society, you know from our children, from our spouses, you know, the value of a stable home with an emotionally stable parent is, you know, something that society cannot, cannot kind of quantify, you know, you can't put an economic value onto that. Um, so, you know, there are times when we as women, especially, and as mothers, there are very difficult times that we go through, like as mothers, you know, physically um, and emotionally. And I feel that sometimes, you know, we feel as though nobody understands us. And I think that feeling has been put into us so that we draw closer to Allah. You know, we stop depending on everyone else. And because he's the only one who can really understand those feelings that we're, we're having, right? Especially during those, you know, those days of childbirth and then pregnancy, childbirth, and then the early years of a child's life. And it's a very demanding time. Uh, perhaps it's to draw us closer to Allah, you know. Um, and it's in times like those that we realize that, that Allah is the one who's there for us, right? He witnesses the hardship that we go through. Um, but we can't underestimate the importance of creating a calm and comforting home for our spouses, um, and you know this the the hadith that I mentioned about uh, Jibril alayhi salam uh, giving glad tidings to Khadija of a house in Jannah where there will be neither noise nor tiredness. The scholars of Islam said the reason why they said he said that where there will be no noise nor tiredness is that Khadija radhiyallahu anha used to put as much effort as she could to create a calm and quiet environment at home for the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam because the, their life outside the home was so, you know, there was so much Islamophobia and there was so much kind of hatred and negativity and shouting and noise, noise. that she created that sanctuary in the home. And mm. for that, Allah said he will reward her, you know, for uh, with a peaceful home in Jannah, subhanAllah. So I think all of us, you know, can can really reflect on what kind of energy are we bringing into our homes? You know, what kind of environment are we creating? Often we as women, we have the power to change the mood of the home. We have the, the power to change the culture of our home, right? Mm -hmm. um, and we don't realize that we have that power. So I would like us to become more mindful of that. Perhaps you could advise people listening because, I mean, what, what you're describing is an ideal, but, I, you know, some, there's part of me that can't help but think that the way society is today, especially in, in the so-called West, in Britain, in New Zealand, and so on, mm -hmm. it, it doesn't give us the luxury of, of living this kind of a lifestyle. I mean, I know here in the UK, at any rate, it is almost impossible to survive financially with only one parent working. And we as women are being forced to, you know, to, to, to be out in the public life, to be economically active, just to make ends meet in many, many cases. Um, mm. And thereby supporting, you know, the, the, our, our families and our husbands, but it takes us away from being there emotionally and physically for our families as well. And, you know, I do sometimes wonder how can we, in this situation that we can't necessarily get out of, 
how can we reconcile this with the idea of being that backbone for our family that we want to be? Mm. That's an interesting question. And, you know, um, actually, I recently had a discussion with on my YouTube channel, you can find it, and on my Muslim Central podcast, um, a discussion I had with Sheikh Haytham al-Haddad about this very topic. And um, it's on a, a series called Ummah Talk that I recently released. Um, and you can find that on my YouTube channel. Uh, and one of the points that he made is that, you know, what is your priority? I think all of us in society, when we want to, when we really want to prioritize something, we prioritize it. If your priority is to build wealth, you will prioritize that. Mm -hmm. If your priority is to raise a family and to in, in, invest in your children, you will prioritize that. And I think, we, and you will make sacrifices for that, right? Mm. So I think I would push back a little bit on, I think this, in many cases, myth that, that we are forced to have mm. two incomes, you know? I think it's a choice. And I know it's, it's, it might be difficult for some people to accept that. But, you know, our deen also encourages us to have a sense of qana'a, which is contentment with what we have, you know. There might be periods of time in our lives when, and, and especially when children are very young, when we will put everything on the side, you know, everything else goes to the side in order to focus on that. Because uh, raising children is an enormous task and it's also a very important task you know it's not something you can just do on the side right mm. and and i think one of the things that um i would like to see is a change in that culture and in the narrative in our communities as muslims you know where we actually prioritize motherhood where we allow mothers to prioritize motherhood <clears throat> because it is a societal thing isn't it it's the whole very much <clears throat> sorry if when the whole community comes together to uh support mothers and to allow mothers to be freed up to focus on that role then they're able to do it right and that takes the men stepping up it takes the society supporting that and and the community supporting that so i think we have to create the environment and uh, you know where we actually start realizing that motherhood is significant is important it's one of the greatest um investments we could make absolutely i think a lot of young mothers who i know personally feel a huge amount of guilt surrounding this issue mm. uh, guilt guilt if you stay home guilt if you go out to work <laughs> It's sort of, you know, they can't mm. win. And I think it's so important for us to reframe how we think about this. That, I mean, obviously there are some women who, because of their situation, do have to leave their children and go out and work. Maybe they're widowed, maybe they're divorced and so on. Mm. You know, and then that is a, a situation that's very sad, but there isn't much they can do about it. But even if society pulled together to help such women and to help yeah. our sisters who find themselves in this situation, I think that it would just, it would benefit everybody because... You know, when you see countries that have a good system in place of, you know, long term maternity leave, longer term paternity leave than what we have in other countries and so on, mm. you do see that children are more well adjusted. They are healthier mentally and physically. They are doing better in education and so on. And there's a lot to learn from that. And I think that we can apply these lessons from the life of Khadija as well to this, you know, this last lesson that you've brought of being the backbone of our family. Mm. you know applying this as well even if maybe we can't be physically present as much as we can but being emotionally present yeah. when we are is so important for everybody concerned subhanallah um yeah and i think i think um we as muslims we were we we should be proud of the fact that our deen actually puts the responsibility for providing financially 
squarely on the shoulders of husbands, right? You know, that's literally one of the kind of rights of Muslim women, right? And we've forgotten that. And there's a reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made that the responsibility of men, right? The primary responsibility of, of the husband, not the wife. And I believe the reason for that is because the role of motherhood is such an enormous undertaking, right? That it requires that women be supported financially and in every way uh, to be able to fulfill that role and to be freed up for that role. So I think we yeah. need kind of like a shift in the way we normalize that in our society because obviously the, the wider society has in general devalued motherhood Absolutely. Um, over, yes. over many decades, you know, of various movements, etc. And 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 that has affected us as well as Muslims, I believe. Somebody has just written a comment that I'd like to touch upon. She's saying, or I'm, I'm not sure if this is a brother or sister writing apologize, apologies for that, but um, the viewer is saying some Muslim feminists say that Khadija radiallahu anha was a businesswoman, so Muslim women must pursue their career and that they should be financially independent. And this is the only lesson that they take from Khadija. <laughs> yeah. So I think I already alluded to that, didn't I? That, hmm. you know, being, first of all, uh, you know, the idea of Khadija Radilanha as a businesswoman, uh, she owned a business, and she, but she wasn't the one who, she wasn't getting up nine to five, you know, <laughs> like, and leaving the house, you know. She that's, delegated. That's, that's not the kind of work it was, you know. Like Maybe it. that shows us that actually entrepreneurship is something that, you know, we as Muslim women, you know, this the rise of mompreneurs, as they call them, right? Maybe yes. that's uh, one of the things we could do because it's something you could actually do from home. But Khadija um, yeah. Anha was... Uh, Rabbatul Mal, she was the one who had the wealth and the and she used to give it to managers. So she would have like a business partner. The Prophet ﷺ was basically her business partner. And she he was responsible for doing the running around and the work, and she provided the wealth. So he would go, he would go and buy, you know, goods from the south, from Yemen, uh, which probably came from India and all sorts of places, and then uh, travel to Mecca and then to Sham, right, to um, uh, uh, to Syria, the area where Syria is today, um, and sell and buy and then travel back down. And so he was the one who was doing the run, the legwork, right? Yeah, and yeah. Um, so so I'm, I'm not trying to say that, trying to diminish uh, what Khadija was as a, as a, you know, successful businesswoman. But what I'm saying is there's no question of, you know, kind of leaving her babies out, you know, like no and i think this is something that we do need to understand she wasn't yeah. getting up in the morning going to an office working nine to five getting home no you know she, she was still able through this 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 business that she had to be in her home and this is really ideal subhanallah when you think mm. about it and and this yeah. idea the word that you've used mom, mompreneur was that it yeah, that's a new this thing. Is, um, yes, subhanallah, subhanallah. And, this and, is and you know, there's a there's a whole movement now in the UK. I think they're called tra traditional wives or trad wives or something. Yeah, of women who are like saying, you know what, we actually want to be women again. We we want to be wives who are financially supported and who focus on the home because the home is a big deal, you know. So there is this kind yeah. of whole movement of women you can find who are trying there to is. reclaim that. I mean, mm. yes. Yeah, just the other day, I was having a discussion around this so-called Islamic feminism with somebody, and I said, you know, that term is problematic because feminism, as we see it in the West, is a reaction to misogyny. It's a reaction mm. to oppression of women. Whereas Islam gives everybody their rights. We don't need to be feminist. We don't need to adopt these outside ideas. And I think that this, this sort of traditional wife thing has been a response to this Western feminism, because mm. for those of us who grew up with Western feminism, myself included, what, what some feminist ideals tell us we can be and should be is actually very exhausting. Right, and it's always holding the man up as the ideal, right? Like, maleness. 
Yeah, maleness is the ideal that we all have to aspire to, rather than saying that no, male and female are distinct, that we have differences, and those differences should be celebrated, that we complement one another, not we're not in competition with one another. Rather mm. than saying that, um, feminists in the past have tried to erase any kind of difference between the male and the female, and that's led to the kind of strange things that you hear that are happening in the news today, right? With people and literally that, not knowing the difference between male and female, not accepting the difference. And I think mm. this very well ties into your second lesson, which was that we should seek our status with Allah, with our creator, not mm -hmm. comparing ourselves to other human beings, not, th you know, not women thinking that they want to be like men or men thinking that, oh, women have it so good, we should be like women not looking at other people and thinking they have status, we want to be like them. No, our status is with Allah. Allah knows who we are better than we know ourselves, subhanAllah. And we should seek his pleasure rather than anything else. I, I, that's what I'm taking away from this, subhanAllah. Um, yeah, I've, uh, I've read in one of the comments, one of the brothers is saying that, you know, most families can survive on one income. It just means you need to spend less, right? I, 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 I would say, I think, that I, think most, yes. <laughs> I think we need to think about that, you know, we really need to think about that as, as and, and I know many families who do that because they're prioritizing the fact that the, they want mom to be able to be there, especially in the early years mm. um, and that the home needs needs that focus. And so what that does is it, it makes, it forces the men to step up, right? It, uh, and, and make sure that they can provide. But also mm. it makes everyone realize, you know what, we need to, maybe we need to simplify our lives a little bit, you know? <laughs> maybe we don't need to go on holiday every year. Yes. <laughs> well, now nobody's going on holiday, right? We, we've all proven we should that all we can do it. Money we can right live now. without the holidays, right? <laughs> so, so I think it's about actually questioning the narratives that we're constantly told. You know, you have to go on holiday every year. You have to have, you have to own your own house. You have to do this. You have to do that. If we question that and say, oh, well, actually, can I live in this way? Is, you know, what do I want to prioritize? That's what it comes down to. And be yeah. proud of that choice, you yeah. know, because prioritizing your children is not anything to be embarrassed about. You know, you're literally I'm investing not. in human beings, right? I mean, I, I personally know several of our Muslim sisters who, you know, through various situations, find themselves as single mothers. And they're only able to work part time because they yeah. have their children to take care of. And yet, you know, with that low so so-called low income that they're bringing in and yet they're able to provide everything that their children want because they're also able to be there you know as much as they possibly can be and it is yeah. a struggle it is a huge struggle but if of they course, can do it a happily married couple can do it yeah and of course we know that there are exceptions but i guess that what i'm talking about is what we want to become the norm right in society mm. Of course, any of us could find ourselves in exceptional circumstances where we do have to do things that are not not the norm that Islam originally promotes, you know? Yeah. yeah. But obviously, as somebody who's speaking about, I'm, I'm trying to talk about like what we want to become the norm in society, right? And even for widows, even for, you know, divorcees, we need to have support systems in place, right? Um, unfortunately, the, this idea of individualism and the nuclear family has meant that, you know, families don't support, don't get support. Um, the idea of a village raising a child, right, mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> has gone by the wayside. Even though many of us have come from cultures, those of us who, you know, were born into Muslim families, we've come from cultures where the nuclear family is not the norm. Uh, you know, yeah. extended family is the norm. And so that comes with its challenges, <laughs> but it also is Im incredibly supporting, you know, for children, for times of crisis, et cetera, et cetera, right? Absolutely. Um, we have actually gone over time a little bit, okay. but there is one last question that somebody has written, which I think it should be asked. If there was one key advice for young Muslims and young Muslims that you could give from the life of Khadija, radiallahu anha, what would it be? 
<clears throat> I think oh, that's so difficult. <laughs> One key advice. I would mm. say, you know, as with Khadija and with other of the great women of Islamic history <clears throat> and the great women who are mentioned in the Quran, um, the thing that you notice that, that binds all of them is that whatever situation Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave them in life, right? Whatever life threw, threw at them. So in Khadija's case, it was that her husband was destined to be the messenger of Allah. Um, they rose to that occasion, you know, they rose to the occasion and they did the right thing. And so I think it's the same with Maryam alayhi salam, right? She was given a huge task and she accepted and fulfilled that task to the best mm. of her ability, right? Um, even though it's a very difficult thing and she knew that her society would vilify her, etc. right? So <clears throat> I think the the thing that binds all of these women is, and, and what we can learn from them is, that in whatever situation Allah has put you and whatever uh, kind of challenges he's put in your way, uh, that you rise to overcoming them and you ask yourself, you know, what is the next right move? What is the thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would want me to do and is asking me to do in this situation? And that's exactly what Khadija did. You know, she she uh, and and that's why she responded in the way she did in being that pillar of strength and support for the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and in doing so spreading the message of islam subhanallah mashallah jazakallah khair um Ustada, for coming on this morning um, alhamdulillah alhamdulillah we have been discussing with Sada Fatima Barakatullah about her book, Khadija, Mother of History's Greatest Nations. Jazakallah khair to our viewers in the UK, in New Zealand, and around the world for joining us today. Um, for those of you who haven't had a chance to read the book yet, there is a free chapter available to download. The link is in the description for today's program. We have gone over time. I do apologize for that. But um, may Allah bless you all for tuning in. Ustada, I hope you will come on again. I think there's so many lessons that you have for our viewers that we could discuss. Um, it yeah. would be lovely. Maybe we can on. go into maybe we can go into the life of Aisha next time. Because that's that my would be wonderful. Next yes. Book, <laughs> so, yes, please. Sure. Um, so for today we have to sign off. Jazakallah khair, everyone, and salam alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Salam alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.